Hi, this is Matt at LSAT Lab, and today's lesson is on sufficient assumption questions in the logical reasoning section. In this lesson, we look at how to spot a sufficient assumption question. We'll look at an example question that contains conditional reasoning, an example question that contains comparative reasoning, and we'll review the trap answer patterns that you need to know about for this question type. It's not a very common question type. Only 6% of logical reasoning questions are sufficient assumption questions but it's one of the harder question types out there since it relies so heavily on conditional logic. So how do you spot a sufficient assumption question? Well, you're looking for language in the question stem that tells you that the answer choice is going to guarantee that the conclusion in the argument follows. So we're looking for words that um, indicate sufficiency and we're looking for words that indicate an assumption. So in this case, we're looking for something that, if assumed, enables the conclusion above to be properly drawn. And that word enables tells us that it's a sufficient assumption question. Now let's try this question stem. It says the conclusion above is properly drawn if which one of the following is assumed. That word if, it's hard to spot, but it tells us that we're looking at a sufficient assumption question. Let's try this one. From which one of the following does the conclusion logically follow? Well, we don't get our typical language cues, but we are looking for an answer choice that from it, the conclusion in the argument will follow logically. So it will guarantee that the conclusion uh, is logical if we add the right answer. And so we're looking for an answer choice that's gonna guarantee the conclusion. That's our task. And it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to prove a conclusion. And so that's gonna limit the structures that we can use when we're working on sufficient assumption questions. So the process that we wanna use the process we want to take whenever we're working on any of the questions in the assumption family is the same. We need, we need to find the conclusion, find the evidence for why it's true, evaluate the reasoning, meaning find the gap in the argument, figure out what's wrong with it, and use that understanding of what's wrong with the argument to anticipate what an answer could sound like. Then we look through the choices trying to match that anticipation, using trap answer patterns to make eliminations along the way. So it's a pretty broad process. But let's put it into practice as we look at a couple of questions here today. So the reasoning structure that we really need to pay attention to when we're working on sufficient assumption questions is conditional logic. 90% of sufficient assumption questions are driven by these if-then relationships. The reason why they tend to use conditional logic is because we are trying to guarantee the conclusion follows. And because conditional logic is so mathematical, it does lend itself very nicely to these provable equations. If A, then B, if B, then C, therefore, if A, then C. And if we're not comfortable using conditional logic, we need, we need to get comfortable with it because it's going to be a really common part of the logical reasoning section and a massive part of sufficient assumption questions. So if you think of the conclusion as a journey from point A, your starting point, to point D, where you finished, then the evidence that they've given us along the way are the segments of that journey that have already been established. And the assumption is the link between them that allows that journey to be completed. So what we're looking for is the gap in the journey that we can then anticipate how to connect those terms in the right answer. So here's an example question. Go ahead and hit pause. Try this question on your own, and when you've had a chance to give it a try, hit play again, come back, and we'll work it through together. All right, welcome back. So the first step is always to find the conclusion, and we can be assisted in that in using language cues that help us find conclusions and premises. In this case, there's a word thus in the last sentence that helps us identify that the conclusion is that Murray cannot be accepted for the position of exec uh, executive administrator. Now, there's a word since that follows that that tells us, hey, we're coming back to more evidence. So don't go beyond that. And the part that's after the word Murray, um, an accountant with both a bachelor's and a master's degree, that's a description of Murray, but not part of what they're trying to establish. So just the part that says that Murray cannot be accepted for the position of executive administrator is the conclusion of this argument. And it's not a relationship. They're not saying if A, then B. They're just saying, hey, this is a fact. He cannot be accepted for position of executive administrator. So what's the evidence for this conclusion? Well, we're given a few things. First, an undergraduate degree is necessary for appointment to the executive board. So the undergraduate degree is the necessary condition. 
an appointment to the executive board is the sufficient condition. We know that because of the word necessary. Necessary is telling us what is required, and it's saying that the undergraduate degree is necessary. We also get that no one with a felony conviction can be appointed to the board. So if you have a felony con conviction, then you can't be appointed to the executive board, and the word no helps us organize that relationship. It introduces the sufficient condition, telling us that a felony conviction is sufficient and that one cannot be appointed to the executive board if they have that felony conviction. Then we're also given that Murray is an accountant with both a bachelor's and a master's degree, so it's a piece of information. It's not a relationship, but just a piece of information that he's got an undergraduate degree. And furthermore, we also have this final piece of information that he has a felony conviction. So we've got a few premises and a conclusion that they're trying to reach. A couple of the premises are relationships. A couple of the premises are facts. And the conclusion is a fact. So now we have to get to the work of trying to figure out what's the missing piece that will allow this argument to come together. Well, we want to start to think about what are the common terms between the premises. And one of the common terms is the idea of an undergraduate degree. It's both the, in one of the statements of fact and in the first relationship. But we can't really use that as a linking mechanism because undergraduate degree is the necessary condition of that relationship. So if we try to use the fact that he's an undergraduate degree to imply that he could be appointed to the executive board, we'd be reversing the relationship in the first premise. There's another common term, felony conviction. Now, in this one, we have met the sufficient condition of the second relationship. He has a felony conviction. Right? So then we can apply the, sec the second premise, the relationship there, with that new piece of information, and we will be able to establish something. So if we filter out the unimportant evidence, the evidence that doesn't really allow us to link anything together, we just focus on the parts that do. Right? If, he has, if you have a felony conviction, then you can't be appointed to the executive board, and Murray has a felony conviction. Therefore, he can't be appointed to be executive administrator. Well, what's the gap here? If we take that first relationship and connect it with the fact that he has a felony conviction, we can infer that he cannot be appointed to the executive board, but that's not quite so far as telling us that he can't be appointed to the executive administrator. So we need to build that bridge that says, if you can't be appointed to the executive board, then you can't serve as the executive administrator. That's the assumption that we need to go find in the right answer. Now let's start with answer choice A. We're going to be looking for this idea between a not being appointed to the executive board and not being an executive administrator. We're going to use that as a template and kind of look for answer choices that relate to that idea. But while we're here, let's go ahead and make sure that we consider each of the choices and try to figure out what's wrong with each of the wrong ones in addition to which one is the right one. So answer choice A says that anyone with a master's degree and without a felony conviction is eligible for appointment to the executive board. If we ignore the part about the master's degree, which is not entirely irrelevant, but but the thrust of this answer choice is that if you don't have a felony conviction, then you're eligible for appointment to the executive board. This is connecting felony conviction and executive board. And the relationship that it's building is that if you don't have a felony conviction, then you can be point appointed to the executive board. So answer choice A is simply negating the relationship in that first premise. Let's go ahead and get rid of answer choice A. Answer choice B says that only candidates eligible for appointment to the executive board can be accepted to, uh, for the position of executive administrator. So this answer choice is definitely connecting the right terms. And it builds a bridge that says if you can be accepted as an executive administrator, then um, you must be eligible for the executive board. This doesn't exactly match what we had anticipated, but it does have the right terms. And if we take the contrapositive of answer choice B, if we both reverse and negate that conditional, then if you aren't uh, eligible for the executive board, then you can't sit as an executive administrator. This is exactly what we're looking for. It matches our anticipation, and answer choice B looks pretty good. Let's hold on to it. Answer choice C says that an undergraduate degree is not necessary for acceptance for the position of executive administrator. Now, answer choice C doesn't build a bridge. It tears down one. It says something is not necessary for acceptance for the position of ex executive administrator. So it doesn't seem like this is going to be a strong contender. It's simply ruling out a relationship as opposed to asserting a relationship. And ruling out that relationship doesn't make it any more likely that we're going to be able to build the bridge. Also, this answer choice rules out a relationship between an executive administrator and having an undergraduate degree. But this does not mean that if you have an undergraduate degree that you cannot be an executive administrator. 
the relationship between these two is being destroyed, not created. So answer choice C doesn't give us a link that we would use in order to build the bridge. We can get rid of it. It's simply an irrelevant relationship. Answer choice D says that if Murray did not have a felony conviction, he would be accepted for the position of executive administrator. So this builds a relationship between not having a felony conviction and being appointed to executive administrator. Now, we know that Murray has a felony conviction, but we can't negate this relationship. We could reverse and negate it, but we can't read it forwards through negation. We can't say that if he has a felony conviction, then he cannot be appointed to the executive administrator. That negates the relationship that would work, and so this is simply a negation of uh, a relationship that could have worked. Answer choice E says that the felony charge on which Murray was convicted is relevant to the duties of the position of executive administrator. Nowhere in the argument does it talk about whether the duties are relevant or irrelevant. So this answer choice is simply out of scope. And so that leaves us with answer choice B as the right answer, something we anticipated. So now let's look at another situation you will, you will occasionally face on sufficient assumption questions. And that is that some arguments are built around comparative reasoning. So 13% of sufficient assumption questions use comparative reasoning as opposed to conditional reasoning. So what this looks like is we tend to look at the size of groups or the amount of something, and we think about it changing over time. Right? So here's an example of, of how a comparison might work. If we know that this year, 15% of stock trades involve fraud, and that 10 years ago, only 5% of stock trades involve fraud, does that mean that more stock trades involve fraud today than did before? Well, it depends. It depends on how many stock trades occurred this year and how many stock trades occurred 10 years ago. Depending upon how we change the um, size of the group, it will have a positive or negative impact in determining whether or not there are more or less or the same number of stock trades that involve fraud this year compared to 10 years ago. So if we put some numbers on this, let's suppose there were 100 stock trades that occurred this year. If 15% of them involve fraud, that means that 15 of them involve fraud. If 10 years ago there were a 100 if 10 years ago there were also 100 stock trades that occurred and we know that 5% of them involve fraud then we know that 5 out of that 100 involve fraud and the idea that there were more stock trades that involve fraud this year than were 10 years ago would be valid right? but we could adjust the situation a little bit so that the conclusion would not follow let's suppose we keep um, 10 years ago at 100 stock trades and it still had 5% of them that involve fraud. So we have five stock trades 10 years ago that involve fraud. And this year, instead of having 100 stock trades, let's bring this down to 20 stock trades. If 15% of those 20 involve fraud this year, then that would mean three of them involve fraud. And so 15% can actually turn out to be a smaller amount depending upon the overall size of the pie or overall size of the group. Right? And so that's the kind of change we want to be able to look out for. What do we want to do to guarantee that the comparison that's occurred within the argument is going to be valid? Next, let's change the picture one more time. And this year, instead of there being 20 stock trades, we'll have 200 stock trades. If 200 stock trades occurred this year and 15% of them involve fraud, well, then we had 30 stock trades that involve fraud. Whereas 10 years ago with 100 stock trades and 5% of them involving fraud, then we had five that had fraud. So a bigger percentage of a bigger amount, a bigger pie, is going to equal a larger amount overall. And so we have to be careful about the overall size of the group so that we can make adjustments to guarantee that the conclusion follows. So we'll be thinking in terms of how can we adjust the comparison that's occurring such that we guarantee that the conclusion follows. So here's another example. Go ahead and take uh, a minute to try this question on your own. Hit pause. And when you're ready to, to work it through together, hit play again, and we'll take a look. All right, welcome back. So the first step, remember, is to find the conclusion. And the conclusion here we can spot with the words, it follows that. At the very end, it says that it follows that M contains twice as many cans as L. So these two groups, group M and group L, and we're talking about the number of cans in each, and they say that there are twice as many cans in group M as there are in group L. Why is that? Well, we have some evidence right before it. It says that all the cans in L were recycled into cans in M, so every can in the group L gets recycled and then turned into the material that is used to create group M. 
And the amount of material other than aluminum in an aluminum can is negligible. So basically, there are other materials that we have to consider. Next, we also know that 50% of the aluminum contained in M uh, was recycled from another group, L. So that half of M came from L. If there were five cans in group L, then we know that half of the material in group M came from group L. And finally, we also know that standard aluminum soft drink cans do not vary in the amount of aluminum that they, ca they contain. So there aren't extra kinds of materials to consider. Um, they don't vary in the amount of aluminum that they contain. And half of the material in group M came from recycled material from group L. Does that guarantee that group M is twice as large as group L? If you think about the percentages, 50%, right? It does work out numerically, right? But that depends on nothing else going wrong, right? So if we think about like, what would it look like if you're going to melt down uh, group L and use that aluminum uh, as the material for creating the cans in group M? Well, if you put it all into a pot and melted it up, and then dump that bowl into another bowl where you're going to create group M or the, the material for group M. As long as all of the material in group L made it over to group M, then yeah, there should be twice as many cans in group M as there are in group L. But if any of that aluminum was lost along the way, like, like batter in a mixing bowl and it got stuck to the sides, then we're not going to exactly get two times as many cans in group M, we'll get two times as many cans as we were able to salvage from the aluminum that was recycled out of group L. Right? So it could be two times, but it might be something less if there was any loss of material during the recycling process. Now that we have a sense for what's wrong with the argument and what we probably want in the answer choices, right, what we want is that all of the aluminum in group L made it over to group M. Let's take a look at the answer choices. Answer choice A says that the aluminum in the cans of M cannot be recycled further. Well, this is simply out of scope. What happens from here on out does not matter. The argument's conclusion is about whether or not the cans in M were twice as many as the cans in L, but what happens in the future is not relevant to this argument. Look out for conclusions that are based in the present, and an answer choice based in the future or a conclusion based in the past and an answer choice based in the present. If the timing is not within the scope of the argument, it doesn't matter. Answer choice B says that recycled aluminum is of poorer quality than unrecycled aluminum. And the idea of poorer quality does not matter. We care about how many cans there are. We don't care about the quality of the, those cans. And so again, B is out of scope. Answer choice C says that all of the aluminum in an aluminum can is recovered when the can is recycled. Well, this kind of matches what we were thinking, Make sure, making sure that we capture all of that aluminum from group L that gets then used in production for group M. If any of it is lost, we're not going to get twice as many cans in group M as there were in L. So C looks pretty good. Let's hold on to C. D says that none of the soft drink cans in group L had been made from recycled aluminum. And whether or not group L had been made from recycled aluminum doesn't actually tell us anything, right? As long as the material is then further recycled into group M, where it came from does not matter. Maybe if we had more information about whether or not uh, recycled material could be further recycled, that might be of use to us. But without that other information telling us that none of the cans in L had been made from recycled material does not guarantee that 100% of, um, of, of the material from group L is going to make it over to group M. And so D is simply out of scope again. E, aluminum soft drink cans are more easily recycled than our soft drink cans made from other materials. Right? How easily it is to recycle these materials does not matter again. Again, we have, in this case, four answer choices that are out of scope, making answer choice C a little bit easier to spot, and that's our answer. So the trap answers you want to be on the lookout for when you're dealing with scope, issues of scope, are simply just those that are out of scope. Those trap answers relating to logic are those that support a premise. Remember, on a sufficient assumption question, our job is to prove the conclusion. We've already accepted the evidence as true because we only really evaluate the validity of an argument, not the soundness of an argument. 
So whether or not the evidence is true or not true doesn't matter. We just accept it as true and ask, does it prove the conclusion? So anything that tries to support the evidence isn't going to make the argument any better since we've already accepted it in the first place. Since so many of these arguments deal with conditional logic, many of the trap answers are going to deal with reversals and negations. So look out for answer choices that build uh, a relationship between the right terms, but either represents a reversal or a negation of the logic that we're looking for. Answer choices that simply build bridges between two terms within the argument are irrelevant relationships, unless those are the right terms to be connected. Right? They're just grabbing terms from in the stimulus, connecting them with only if or unless in order to make it look very tempting because if you don't have a clear impression of what it is that you're looking for before you go to the choices, and these answer choices that are irrelevant are not out of scope. They, are, they relate to the argument, and so they're going to be a little bit harder to get rid of. Right? So look out for answer choices that are just random terms then connected in a relationship. And then finally, when it, with, re, with regard to degree, you want to look out for answer choices that are too weak. On sufficient assumption questions, the stronger the answer choice is, the more likely it is to prove the conclusion. So answer choices can't really get into trouble for being too strong, but they do get into trouble often for being too weak, meaning that they help, but they don't prove the conclusion. So in summary, you spot a sufficient assumption question with language cues within the question stem that give you a hint of sufficiency. Words like enables, ensures, suffices, allows, would make, or if. If you're looking at an assumption question and you see those kinds of language cues, you're looking at a sufficient assumption question. The reasoning structures you want to be on the lookout for are conditional logic and comparison, with conditional logic being the dominant reasoning structure on this question type. And then the, the really important trap answer patterns that you want to be paying attention to, those that are out of scope, those that are too weak to, uh, to prove the conclusion, those that either reverse or negate the terms in a, in a relationship, uh, and those introduces that simply support the evidence as opposed to bridging the gap between the evidence and the conclusion. So that's it for today's lesson on sufficient assumption questions. I invite you to check out these other videos or come visit us today at lsatlab.com.